you. So I'm Bill Shields. I'm actually joined in the room by the product manager, Mark Schneider, Hello. and the director of product management for UCS, RV Martin. We're here really to listen to your feedback more than anything else. We really want you to ask a lot of questions. So this form factor is not new to the industry. It's new to Cisco. So this is all about dense compute. So if you think about it, if you want a lot of memory, that'd be a four socket, a C480, a B480. If you need a lot of storage, that'd be an S3260. Now we're going dense compute. That's the C4200 with the C125M5 compute nodes. So think about this in that context. It's all about density. So I'm going to turn it over to Craig. He's going to lead you through all the good technical stuff. Uh, if he doesn't go deep enough for you, go grab his slides from this morning, listen to it, or just ping him here. We're also down on the show floor in both the AMD booth and in the Cisco <coughs> booth. So come down there. You can actually pet the hardware and ask us more questions. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Hi, everybody. I'm Craig Ashupa. I'm a technical marketing engineer with UCS. And let's go ahead and get started. So this is a very technical session. It's not going to be going through the business slides. Uh, Bill and uh, go ahead and uh, Mark and talk about that. This is a summary slide of the actual platform. And so here, basically, what you have, this is the front view. So this is the rear view. <clears throat> you have 24 drives in the front here. Okay, and you'll have, what you have here is, if you look at the numbering, you have drives one through six, and then you have another one through six, and one through six, et cetera. And then you have these little one, two, three, four, five. So that's like the difference from a marking perspective compared to this, let's say a C240, when you're looking at it from the front. So the drives are actually, are actually fixed to each one of the server nodes. So it's not like you can go ahead and take these drives and go ahead and assign it to whatever nodes you, you want. They're actually fixed. So these six are going to server node one, the next six are going to server node two, et cetera. Okay, so from, a, from, and from the back perspective, you have the server nodes over here, one, two, three, and four. Okay, we'll talk about what all the things are on this in the, in the coming slides. Dual power supplies over here. Uh, you'll see in the next slide where the fans are. And then over here, you'll have all of the options in relation to your memory, your, your drives, um, SATA, SAS, uh, NVMe drives. Uh, you have one or two AMD Epic CPUs that, w that, we, that we have a, another PID sheet on that we can provide later. Uh, and then all the different options that are available. Really more of a, of a summary slide to give you a one slide picture of, of the technology, as well as two things to talk about. Some things you'll have a single asterisk, other ones you have a double asterisk. The single asterisk says that th something is post-FCS. And what that means generally is that it's already gone through our execute, commute, uh, ex execute commit process, which means that it's already on the table to actually get developed. Other, th other things you'll see is in planning, which means that it's something that product management has asked for and that right now we're just waiting to schedule that into a specific release going forward. Okay, Just a couple notes in relation to that. So looking top down with the, with the, with the cover off on this box, <clears throat> here you're going to see server one and server three. And underneath there, there are two more servers, as we talked about in the previous slide. You have some really large fans over here that brings a lot of airflow into the box based on those four, the density. You have to have a lot of, a lot of airflow on there. So these are some fairly large double stacks uh, fans that are there. <clears throat> You have right here in this area a thing called a chassis management controller. You can't access that external to the box. It's primarily for controlling the environmentals in the box, the fans and the power supply. And we'll, we'll, you'll see later on that there's a component on here that goes ahead and talks to each one of the BMCs, the CIMCs that are on each one of the boxes there, the management controller, that go ahead and coordinates the fan and the power between it since it's a shared, shared chassis. Another thing you see here that's a little bit different from, from many of our other uh, products is that the, if you have a RAID controller in the, in the server nodes, okay, usually what we'll do on a server node is you'll have your RAID controller and you'll have your super cap with that together on that particular node. Because of, because of area density on the, actual, on the actual server node, we have to actually move that super cap to a central region within the actual enclosure itself. So if you were to have four server nodes with four uh, RAID controllers. You don't have to have RAID controllers on here. As you'll see as we go through the presentation, you would have four super caps in here. Not battery, they're the, they're the capacitors. And each one of those are wired to each one of the server nodes. Over here, you have behind this metal plate going down there is you have your SAS SATA NVMe backplane. And from there, there's, there's, there's traces that go from each one of those drives to their, their respective server nodes in the enclosure itself. Any questions on this particular slide? Oh, 
here's the actual server node itself. And this one has a VIC 1455 <clears throat> in there. And it's a four ports, port one, two, three, and four. Okay, down here you have, an, this one has an OCP, the OCP option, which we'll talk about as well, right there. This is your one gig uh, management port. This is your, for your KVM, uh, bringing up a, a crash cart to that and setting it up initially if you need to or troubleshooting it later on. And behind here you have a, uh, a times eight uh, PCIe slot. This is a times 16, this is a times eight, this is an OCP slot. Um, right here you'll have a, you have a, uh, a recessed button that is for your power. It's also LED, uh, so you don't mass that. Since there's multiple uh, nodes within this box, we recessed it so you didn't accidentally hit it and keep going by um, working on one of the other boxes there. On this slide, you'll see single or dual uh, AMD EPIC processor configurations on here. We have many different uh, core counts in, in, in relation to the EPIC proce uh, processor family that's on here. Uh, if you're going to be running NVMe, just a note, if you're going to run NVMe, <clears throat> you have to have CPU2 in there because the NVMe's are being driven off of CPU2. Okay? Um, and then you, have, you also have 16 DIMM slots with different memory configurations, uh, all the way up to 128 for a two terabyte max for each one of the nodes. You have onboard, you have two SD or M.2 options on there with the holders, respective holders for those. Then you have a SAS SATA array controller, if you, know, if you don't want that. It also has the onboard SATA <coughs> controller. Those are, if you know anything about the switch on a chip from an AMD perspective, those um, AHCI controllers are actually on the, the chip itself. So there's not a separate PCH controller, which we'll talk about a little bit later um, when we talk about power. It's relevant there. But in relation to AMD, your controllers for your SATA drives, um, you have four, the four NUMA regions on the actual processor itself. Each one of those actually has a uh, the SATA, SATA controller on there, on the chip die itself, not a separate, uh, like a C6600, 6100, or whatever, from a PCIe perspective. As I mentioned, two 3.0 PCIe slots, one times eight, one times 16. One OCP, 2.0 slot, a TPM 2.0, to do for security, if you have that option on there. Um, then you have the one gigabit management port. And we'll talk about management as well as we get through the presentation. The options are there. Any questions on this slide? So purely an AMD platform. Today it's only, a, it's purely AMD platform. Okay. This is a top view of the box without the, without the cover on it. <clears throat> and here you'll see You'll, this is the times eight. Um, if you don't, if you if you have a RAID controller, that's where it, that you'll take take that times eight slot right there. Uh, but you don't have to have the RAID controller. Again, you can run it in AHCI mode using the, using the SATA onboard SATA, if you want. Over here, you have your times sixteen PCIe slot, and that'll be using a VIC. If you have a VIC in there, you don't have to have a VIC in there. It's an option. You have your, as I mentioned, the dual SD M2, M2 carrier right there, and then you'd go ahead and put your, your, your SDs or M2s in there, and we'll talk about that in depth in, in a little bit. And your 16 DIMMs, uh, four per CPU that are on there, one or two CPUs. <clears throat> and the front view, I already talked about this. Um, the only difference in between this slide and the other slide that we talked about before is here you also have UC, a USB 3.0 port where you can go ahead and put in a USB card in case you wanted to go ahead and load an operating system or something like that use over vMedia. Another interesting thing I don't have on here, I don't have on here, is that on, you can actually put in a micro uh, USB as well onto the CIMC for if you want to have a staging area for things like software uh, loads and, and OSs and these types of things from a v, another vMedia perspective. Just confirmation on the RAID controller does support JBOD for the it does. status drives. Okay. Yes, and I have, a I have a slide on that as well, um, but it supports um, RAID 0, uh, 1, uh, 5, 6, and JBOD, um, and you can have a mix of those. So you can have, like, for instance, two drives running in, running in a RAID 1 and four drives running in, um, you know, a, uh, in, in JBOD if you want. So you can have it however, mix and match however you want. It's a, a 9460 uh, LSI. We're using the Harpoon ASIC, and we'll talk about that. Any more questions on this slide? Okay. Qualified operating systems. So at FCS, these are the targeted operating systems that, that we're going through. Now, this is dynamic. We're still working through these. Uh, and a lot of the, 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 uh, the drivers on these, is not, no pun intended, is based on the drivers that are available, uh, specifically for the 12 gig uh, RAID controller. Uh, and the, we really, 
we really want to make sure that the, the versions that were released have the inbox drivers. So we don't have to go through the whole process of having to go ahead and, and, and stream, uh, strip stream, strip, strip stream, slipstream, <laughs> slipstream the drivers uh, during the OS load to make things easier. Uh, so we want to make sure that the drivers are, are inbox and we're working with the different manufacturers of the operating systems to make sure that that is the case. Um, in relation to Ubuntu, for instance, it just hasn't been released yet, 16.04.5. That'll have the, the, uh, the driver, supposedly, for the new Harpoon ASIC from LSI. Uh, and the, also in relation to um, Red Hat and, and CentOS, you want to make sure that those are inbox. Anything on here, any versions that you see that are, are important to make that, that we haven't included on here? So let's talk about connectivity. How do we connect to this thing? How do we get to it? How do we manage it? So Ethernet, all sorts of flavors, 10, 25, 100, 1632 fiber channel, 100 gigabit InfiniBand. <clears throat> now let's talk about that a little bit. <clears throat> At FCS, we're going to have the 1455, which I'll talk about in the next, sli next slide. Okay, that's going to offer you the 1025 gigabit. That's our fourth generation VIC, which has been released as a part of this platform, but hasn't been released in general in relation to our other C and B series yet. Okay, so there's probably not a lot of information out there in relation to the fourth gen, but I'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit depth um, coming up. The 1632 fiber channel, that is in planning. It's something that we have. We've, we have the, the, the models that we're, that we're, that we're going to uh, qualify. Now we just have to get an engineer and commit as to when they're going to actually qualify it and test it and put it on our HCL. Okay. Uh, 100 gigabit uh, InfiniBand, uh, Melonix uh, card on there. Uh, we're working on, we're, we're, it's going to be qualified post FCS. Uh, now whether that's, we're going to actually be offering that as a Cisco PID or not is something that's TBD. Okay, but we're still going to still going to be supported within our within our H, HCL. So a lot of a lot of different options from a connectivity perspective, and you can run you can mix and match things. So if I have one node running you know fiber channel 16 gig, I can have another one running 32 gig, and I have another one not running anything at all, and like another one running you know 10 10 gigabit Ethernet with fiber channel. It's really up to you. You don't have to have it across the board. So each server node itself can be configured the way that you needed to have it for that particular whatever application is running on there. So let's talk about the VIC 1455 a little bit, our new fourth generation. Uh, here you see it over here, and you have your four, four ports, port one, two, three, and four. Okay, and that, that, that's going to make a difference in relation to those ports that you'll see in the next slide from a connectivity perspective and how you connect this into your network, your northbound network. <clears throat> it's a VIC. It's a Cisco VIC. So all the features that we have today on a VIC are pretty much on there as well, plus additional ones. As you see here, uh, post-FCS RDMA V2 will be on there, post-FCS. Uh, we also have NetFlow, which will be on there as well, uh, post-FCS. Uh, and then everything else that you see here, Pixie boot, iSCSI boot, FCUE boot, you know, going to your FC network uh, northbound, uh, your virtual adapters, one thing, VMFX, SREOV for Red Hat, KVM only. Okay. It go ahead and occupies that 16 uh, times 16 uh, uh, PCIe adapter uh, port that, that we talked about before. And again, standalone mode and UCS mode, which we'll talk about in one second as to how this connects northbound. So let's talk about how we connect this. This is a UCS, this is a UCS managed slide right here. And this shows that, so, this one will show, this shows having two going to FIA and two going to FIB. Everybody here knows UCS, I assume, from an FI perspective, correct? Yes? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So you have your, your two going to, port one and two going to FIA, port two, three and four going to FIB. If you have two cables connected into your FIs, these will be in a, hard, in a hardware port channel on there. Okay, and those, those aren't configurable. You can't configure that and you can't configure the hash. It's like, I believe it's a, I haven't looked into the fourth generation, but I assume it's the same as the third, which was a seven-tuple hash uh, based, on, based on destination, source, all these sorts of things that I could de determine which packets the line goes on, the, line, the, up, the, the link, which are the two links that goes on in that, in that port channel. Um, it, it goes ahead, and you can also have your OS bonding there layer if you want as well. You don't have to have two there. You could just have one if you want it. So you could have one go into FIA and one go into FIB if you didn't want the extra bandwidth and you just want to use those additional ports on your FIs. So this is for US, UCS manager mode. 
Now, from a standalone perspective, again, you can have it at you can have it as in port channel mode as well. Same thing's gonna happen. You go ahead and connect this up to your Tor A. This one going up to the top of rack switch B. It would be in a hardware in a, in a, in a hardware a hardware port channel. You would go ahead and set up a, a, a static port channel on each one here. This LACP is not supported uh, from the static port channel perspective, but you could go ahead and go ahead and put OS bonding in there as well. L LACP would not be an available option for you in relation to these hardware port channels. And again, you don't have to use all of them. You can just use one if one and one if you don't want to use additional ports if you didn't need the bandwidth on there. And these can be 10, 25 gigabit, each one of those. Now the second mode we have on here is called discrete mode. And so within the, the within the manager, within within the CIMC manager <clears throat> for standalone, you can go ahead and set it to either to be discrete mode. And what discrete mode will do is it makes it so that each one of these ports is not in that hardware port channel we talked about a second ago. Okay, and so from here, each one of these is basically just an individual link. There's no, no hardware port channel, no software port channel. And if you want, you can go ahead and put a OS bonding up here, and you can do LECP at that point, once you're in discrete, in discrete mode. And then you can also, if you want, this picture down here shows each port going to an individual LAN independently. Hardware bonding and something I just missed, is that a new thing or a new-ish thing? Not really, no, we've done it. Like for instance, if you know anything about the S series and the way we come, at, we come out of the, uh, the SIOC, um, if you go ahead and were to take that and break it out, and you would and you would use a 40 gig QSAP on the SAOC, and then go that and break it out to a four four by ten. Mm -hmm. If you were to connect those four by tens to a switch, those would be you'd have to put those into a, into a static port channel as well. Okay. Right. So it's 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 not it's no different than that. Okay. Thanks. So again, three modes. You have UCS Manager. From the fourth generation, you have you have the the um, the port channel mode from a hardware port channel perspective, and you also have discrete mode. And then within those, you you can go ahead and do OS bonding as well if you want. This is and this is supported in, in switch independent, meaning no VPC or switch dependent, which has VPC as well. It supports both. So OCP, you guys know what, AC, what OCP is, standard uh, hardware specification for mezzanine cards. Okay, we're gonna be going ahead and offering uh, OCP 2.0 and 1.0 cards within, the, within, within, this, within the, the, the port available. It's a 16 gig, excuse me, a 16 lane PCI Gen 3 slot. It's on the bottom left hand corner of that, of that slot that I showed you before. And these are the cards um, that are available at FCS, the QLogic 10 and 25s. And then post FCS, we're going to be having the 100 gigabit, and then as well as the uh, InfiniBand, 100 gig uh, InfiniBand card available for you there. So a lot of different options from a networking perspective, uh, both from a VIC perspective, uh, non-VIC in that 8x8 eight eight and by 16, depending on which cards we qualify, as well as OCP. So lots of different uh, connectivity options that are available for this, and you can mix and match and have, you know, go in all sorts of networks and all sorts of things that, that to your heart's desire. There's no requirement that the you have your four nodes that they have to have the same cards in any of them. Absolutely they not. Can all be, they can all be different. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep, you can have you know this one going to fiber channels I mentioned before. This one going to using 100 gigabit Finiband. This one down here going to something else, and you can mix and match however you want. Okay, cool. Yep, each one of the nodes are independent, so they're 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 configured independently. They can have different hardware uh, options in there. They're managed independently. There's 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 nothing from a a dependency perspective between between the four that they actually have to all be managed. Excuse me, they all have to be configured the same. That goes for network and it goes for storage as well. Okay. Okay. And I have a, well, now we're getting into storage, so you'll see that as well within this within the storage topologies that are available. Ninety four sixty using the LSI. Uh, what is it? The thirty five oh eight ASIC, which is Harpoon. This runs the LSI uh, MR stack, the Mega Raid stack. Okay, we don't have the IT stack yet. It's something that we're looking at um, in the shared target stack for a pa HPA pass-through. However, day one, as I mentioned, you can go ahead and run RAID 0, 1, 5, 6, and 10. There's no reason to run 50, 60 because we don't have the drive, the drive numbers uh, to be able to do that. So, it doesn't, so we, it's capable of it, it's just we wouldn't qualify. The, the hardware is not there to, to support it from a number of drive perspective. And JBOD, and you can have those mix and match. Okay, SAS drives and SATA. SAS at, at 12 gigabit and, SAS, and SATA at, at 6 gigabit, uh, of course, running at eight, uh, eight times PCI Gen 3 lanes on there. Has a two gigabyte flush and four gigabyte on-fi 
for backup in case you were to lose power or something like that, your write cache would go ahead and get uh, moved over to your on fi flash on, on board on there. And the super cap would make sure that, it made, that that power was there to move that data over um, during, in case of failure. Uh, from a KMIP uh, SED perspective, it has the capability to do that. It has, on, it has the software, it has the safe store, LSI safe store to support SED and, and KMIP capabilities. Uh, at FCS, it won't be available because from a qualification effort perspective, but it is, on the, uh, it is on the roadmap to go ahead and do that going forward. So if you're going to be running the, um, the sec secure drives uh, with or without KMIP, you don't have to have KMIP with that. You can do stuff locally with UCS or locally with a standalone. Um, but if you were to have KMIP, it has both those capabilities. So some storage options, you know, lots of different storage options that are on here. You have the HDD SSD that's available um, up, up in the front, six drives per. Okay? Uh, or you have NVMe as well up front. Uh, from an HDD SSD perspective, that's going to be handled by either your 9460 uh, uh, 12 gig uh, RAID controller, optional RAID controller that, that you put on there. Or if you don't have that, it would be running through the, the, the SATA uh, that's running off of your AMD. Okay. I write here, just so you know, I write here SCH. I just want to point this out. If you look at the, if you look, if you dig into it, on AMD, it's actually not the SCH. We, it, it, AMD uses that term kind of loosely. Um, they actually use it either, either SCH um, for a server controller hub. They also call it F, FCH or Fusion Controller Hub, which was their previous generation, as well as um, what, the, what it's actually running on within the S, for the switch on it, for the system on a chip. It's called an IO, it's IO, IO Hub Complex, I believe is actually what it's called. But to, from a manageability naming perspective and from a customer perspective, they're used to an Intel PCH uh, for that type of capability, running AATI stuff. So we're going with the SCH just from a naming perspective. So if you have a, if, you, if someone says, well, actually, that's not that SCH, you, you'll know that. It, it's, it's actually the, it's on the IO, um, IO hub complex, which each one of the NUMA regions on, on the CPU actually has that. Your M2 gum holder. Right there, uh, that can go ahead and hold those M2 drives. You know, at FCS, it's going it's going to be SATA uh, only. Um, we are looking at the cap that the possibility of putting the NVMe on there as well um, at a future date. As you know, there's different sizes of NVMe. Right now, we have to qualify, we have to look at the actual size NVMe to be able to qualify that because uh, there's different physical dimensions on that and restraints on on the uh, on the um, the server node. But that was something that we had in plan to do. Uh, if you don't have the M2 and you want to have SD, you can have you can have the SD. The M2s are going to be running are going to be driven by those the AHCI SATA controllers on the uh, AMD processors. The SD card controller right there, there is just like and on any of our, our other platforms that support SD, it's going to be using the Flex Flash controller, which is actually on the card holder itself, to make sure that those SDs are mirrored. Okay. Um, and we also have something else that's going to be coming out that we have, I'm not sure it's going to make it to FCS or not. We're trying, but it's not 100%. And that is, we have a, we're designing another, S, another M2 card holder there that actually has a hardware RAID chip on the, the card holder itself. And it'll go ahead and RAID those M2s together um, using hardware RAID on the actual holder. So it won't be the 12 gig uh, RAID controller I was talking about before. It's actually on the holder itself. Um, whether we'll make that for FCS or not, I don't know. They're pushing hard to try to make that a reality. Uh, then you have, as I mentioned before, the internal micro SD drive that, that'll, that goes within, within the box itself. There's a slot for that. And that is for, for like a staging area, something for operating systems or software that you go ahead and put in your, on your vMedia. OK, any questions on this? So this is a topology. Let's talk about the topology a little bit. I have a number of different stuff, number of slides on here that goes into each one individually. This is one that, I, that has basically most of them put together into one. This tells you a bunch of different things. Number one, it goes through various configurations in how disks and storage are managed uh, through, throughout a system, the, the possibilities that are there. It also sends a message that says that just like on the networking question you had where you can have different networking on each, on each server node, you can also have different storage configurations on each storage node as well. And they can all be different between storage nodes. So for instance, on this one, say this, is, this, this right here is server node one. This one has a RAID controller on there. Okay? 
So you have all six drives being driven by a RAID controller, which is then connected to your server motherboard by a Gen 3 times 8 lanes. This one over here has an NVMe. Okay. So your NVMe drive in, in the blue, and you have five SAS, or SAT, five SAS or SATA. The five SAS or SATA are going to your RAID controller. And you have your one NVMe that's connected directly to your AMD. That would be AMD uh, processor number two, as I mentioned before. Okay. Over here, you have, you have six drives. These are all with no RAID controller. Those are going to be SATA drives, since, they, since you, have to, you can't run the SAS drives off of, these, off of the AMD. You have to be SATA drives. Okay, so that's, you have those shown directly to the AMD. And over here you have two NVMEs and you have four SAS or SATAs going to your RAID controller. So it tells a lot different topologies. I have separate topology diagrams that we went through this morning in the longer, longer session to go through each one of these. But this is basically tells you that, that lots of different possibilities depending on what needs you need for the particular solution you're running on that specific node and you can mix and match depending on what, how you want to configure those. Or you can have everything the same if you want. So it really depends on what you need. Very configurable. From a management perspective, so management, standalone, using UCS, the UCS uh, management control, I, the CIMC, just like you would today, same, same tool that you would have on, a, on a other C series. Cloud and standalone and domain, intersite. Okay, and then if you're just running a domain, you can use UCS manager, just as, as you know today. So Again, it depends on how you want to manage it. Standalone, UCS if you have UCS, or if you have UCS and you want to do it through the cloud, you can do it through Intersight. Or you can do Intersight with standalone. Is this skipping support for supervisor for people that are custom, that currently have it installed? IMC like, supervisor will not, be, will not support this. Okay, so. This okay. would be the solution. Yep, okay. Yep. This is it. This is the this is the uh, C4200 in, inside of Intersight. So we they finished the back end piece a couple of weeks ago. We just got this the front end piece. They, they're polishing it up now. Um, and I was able. This is a live. This was this was a live system, an engineering system that I was able to grab the uh, screenshot off of like sometime last week. Um, this is just given the general. This is the, the the rear view of it. If you do the top view, it basically just shows you the top view of the actual server node. Um, this is showing server node two down here. All the other, the, you guys had Intersight before this. Is that true? Yes? Mm -hmm. yeah. So you probably saw it in demo of, of Intersight. So this is basically it in, in Intersight. If you go to the inventory, I don't have a picture of that right now, but you have to go into inventory. It basically just shows you here in the tree mode everything that's in the box. And then you have HCL that can go ahead and interface with a, in a driver, if for instance, on, on ESX, a, a, that you would go ahead and um, load in there that could pull up things like drivers and those types of things. And then you can go ahead and go and compare what, the, what it's seeing on the box with what we have on the HCL to tell you whether you're in compliance with the HCL, whether you're not, whether there's upgrades available, and what you need to, and giving you advice, proactive advice, into what to do going forward. So this slide is basically just telling you that the, the, the architecture of the standalone management is the same as what we have on our other C-series. And V series, okay. So you have your you have your, your C4200 here. You have your CIMC, and you have access into the AV, via via GUI, GUI or CLI. From there, you have your XML API, SNMP, and a bunch of other stuff, which we'll talk about in a second. For your APIs going into there, for a management program programmability managing of that, and then you have your management tools and integrations, which are interfacing with those different APIs. So everything again that we have in relation to your standard C-series, you can go ahead and apply to your 4200. So if you have scripts, programs, these types of things, they, you might not have to change them so much in order to introduce this into your infrastructure. Okay. I didn't actually add the other slide I wanted to add. I don't think I have that slide on here. But it, we have things like all the, the various integrations we have on here are Things like Python, uh, Power, Power Tool, uh, Redfish, uh, the DNTF, Redfish, IPMI, SNMP, XML, CLI, GUI. Uh, so lots of different things, lots of ways to manage this, um, either manually, either through UCS, either through Intrasite, or through API driven. So here, this is from a standalone perspective. And this, what this slide is saying is that you can manage it a couple different ways from a, from a network a network adapter perspective. So on the box, you have a one gigabit management port on there. 
And if you were to have a VIC on there also, it provides you with two different options. You could either do it through dedicated mode, where your one gig management port, you go ahead and take that and you plug that directly into your tour uh, up north, okay? And, you can, and your traffic would go over that dedicated, that dedicated one, one gigabit management port. If you had a VIC, then you could go ahead and change it to Cisco card mode. And rather than, rather than util, utilizing additional network ports on your northbound switch, you would just go over your same, the same VIC to, for your management traffic. So you have the capability to, to configure that on a node by node basis. So one node, if you had a VIC on it, you could go ahead and run that over your VIC. Another node, if you didn't have, if you didn't have a VIC on it, you can run it over your one gig uh, management. Another node, if you had a VIC on it, but you didn't want to use it, you could put it on the one gig and vice versa. So each one is independent, just like we had in the storage, just like we had on the network. I mentioned at the beginning the CMC, that, that central uh, point within, within the enclosure, chassis management uh, controller. Right, so the, we have an enclosure that has fans and power that are shared. Okay? So how do we coordinate that between the different nodes that we have on there? So what we have is each one of the BMCs has, a, has an endpoint, a network endpoint, which is on a part of a local LAN that is on this, we call the switch on a chip. That's physically on that CMC. It doesn't actually interface with the CMC. The CMC isn't an endpoint on there, but it, it, we, that's where the switch is. And there's a, local, there's a local network internally. It's not accessible from the, from the external. You can't get to it. Basically what it does is when you bring the nodes up, one of the nodes goes ahead and elects itself as master by a certain algorithm. And then that, what happens is all the BMCs on each one of the nodes, it sends telemetry data in relation to environmentals and things to that, B, that master BMC. That master BMC will then go ahead and control the fans and the power to make sure that, that, that everything is OK for everything in that, in that particular enclosure. OK, now, if this were to go down, OK, it doesn't take, it's not a single point of failure. Everything, the fans just go to 100%, and everything keeps working until you go ahead and resolve that issue. OK? If something were to go down and this node were to go down, there's an election process. One of these will become the master. And then at that point, the other BMCs that are there will go ahead and start communicating with that new master. And that new master would go ahead and be able to control the fans according to your fan policies and your power policies. I did have this slide on here. These are the DevOps. This is what I was talking about before in relation to the APIs that are available for managing it. So as I mentioned, UCS Power Tool, Python, IPM, SNM, SNMP, DMT Redfish, Puppet, Ansible, XML. So all sorts of things in relation to manage these programmatically. So if you don't want to use the GUI, we have a lot many customers who don't use the GUI. They don't use UCS Manager. They do everything through scripts. They do everything through, through, through programming. And that's what they like. We provide it, just like we have on the B series and just like we have on the other, other C series servers and the S series. Power, power consumption, there's two 2400 watt power supplies in there. And they can be run in, in non-redundant N plus one and grid modes, if you want. Um, they don't, the, the power supplies aren't assigned specific server nodes. Both the power supplies go to a common power rail within, within the enclosure itself. And th that power rail goes ahead and feeds all four of, the, all four of those server nodes, similar to the, the way we do it with the S-series, where they have the four power supplies in the S-series, and they all, all feed into a common power rail. Typical C125 is 300 watts. Uh, typical 4200 is 1500 watts. And it's in the Cisco UCS power, genera power, power generator. To the power calculator, look under the modular. Don't look under the rack if you're going to be looking at that. Okay. Uh, one thing to notice, notice when you start looking at the, um, if you look at the, at the, we have another. It's not on here. It's in the part of our business, our business deck on here. We have a radar. Uh, it's a radar graph, and it shows. And we also have a table that talks about power. And one of the things that make sure that you, that you consider when you're looking at power in relation to the C125 is that. As I mentioned before, the, the AMD processor doesn't have that PCH controller, which is a separate, separate chip set. It doesn't, have that, it doesn't have the power requirement. All that power is actually on the SOC itself. So when you're calculating your power and looking at these types of things, remember that there's less components here. That when, you, when you're looking at as one, even one of our systems, looking at what, an Intel-based system, there you also have to add on the power of that PCH controller as well. Just something to take into consideration when you're looking at that type of stuff. UCS 4.0 into integration, it's managed by third and fourth generation. Okay, first, second generation, it's not supported. UCS Mini, it's not supported. 
It's also not supported. I don't think I have a slide on this in here, but if you want to head and go ahead and, and have one node on UCS Manage and one node standalone, we don't support that. Um, if you think that there's use cases, please let us know in relation to that, that where you have, you'd have one or two or whatever nodes being UCS Manage and other ones that are standalone. Okay. Creates a rack enclosure object over here. Okay, and each one of the racks are, will be go ahead and, and manage individually. As I mentioned, the fans and PCs are shared on there. And when you go ahead and click on a specific, on a specific server node within the rack, it'll go ahead and show you the disks that are associated with that particular rack, which helps you in troubleshooting, et cetera. The server node itself, the server creates a server object under the rack enclosure on here, so you can have a minimum of two server nodes within a, within, within a rack enclosure from an ordering perspective, but then you can go ahead and add a third and a fourth after that. They don't have to all be ordered at the same time, so it can grow as you grow on here. They, each one is managed individually, so just like they configure individually, they're also, excuse me, just like they're configured hardware-wise individually, they're also configured software-wise and personality-wise within UCS individually, as well as standalone. So things like your storage profiles, your, your network profiles, your policies, your templates, all those things are gonna to apply to, your, to each one of these server nodes on an individual basis, just like they would on a standalone C-series box or on a B-series blade. The storage that's, 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 that's internal, uh, that, 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 that's in the front, the six drives that are on there, if you have the RAID controller on there, you're gonna be utilizing the storage profile. You can utilize the storage profiles, you don't have to but you can use the storage profiles for that. The storage profiles allows you to go ahead and create that disk geometry that you would normally do through BIOS tools, through, for instance, LSI tools, uh, when you first bring it up using F2 or the Control M or Control L, whatever the control uh, characters are for that, Control R, I believe it is, uh, for, on Cisco. You don't have to use that. You can do it all through your storage, your service profile, which go, go ahead and go ahead and consume your storage profile. Integration option, I already talked about this before. Standalone management, this is what's supported. Third, genera third generation, both of, both of our boxes here. The fourth generation, which we haven't released yet, which is 6454, of course, that'll be on there. Uh, and then you have your fabric interconnects that aren't supported in the UCS Mini. This is where I mentioned in relation to the mix management being not supported. So in summary, from a technical perspective, compute intensive 2U multi-node chassis, okay? AMD based, connectivity flexibility, storage your way, policy driven shared power of fan, UCS standalone and cloud manageability. Basically it's, a, you have dense compute, highly configurable on a node by node basis, depending on how you need it and how the customers need it, okay? Very few restrictions as to what can and can't be between different nodes. I haven't seen actually many at all, to be honest with you. Um, each one is, is configured, uh, ordered individually on an individual basis, and it, it's, uh, it's, you know, provides very high density uh, price uh, per watt uh, per, per core compute. So that was a great, I mean, that was great technical overview. Um, from, a, from a positioning point of view, where are you guys, where do you think this fits? I mean, where, oh. where, what customers are gonna buy this? What Absolutely. ones should be looking at it? Bring up one, one, let me bring up one slide okay. for you. Um, and it's that, um, it's that uh, radar slide I was talking about before. Uh, let me just try to find that just real quick. Give me two seconds. I'm gonna have so, it. While Craig's pulling that up, this is all about density. This is where that plays. So I said we had, you know, Memory would be four socket, storage would be the S3260. Uh, this is all about dense compute. How many cores, Here we go. how many servers do I need to stack in a rack? So here's a great radar that uh, Bill went ahead and put together. And what it does is it compares our, our C125, B200, C220, and, C30, and S3260. So of course, from a disk perspective, you'd go with the S3260 if you need a really high dense dense disk, disk, disk compute. If you look over here at, at the cores, okay, this is, when, when we look at this, you have, you have, this is a rack, by the way. This is a whole rack full of 42U rack. 5,376 total cores within one 42U rack. Compared to our next highest, which would be the B200 M5, 
Or if you look, look at a standalone B220, which is our high, next highest density box, would be 2,352 cores. So more than double the cores. So very high density plays. Things like, things like simulating, modeling, high frequency trading, fraud detection, um, online gaming, uh, public and private clouds, depending, like NFV, if you want to do, do those types of things. Um, retail, where you put it, where you, where you might need to have multiple, multiple servers for driving different things, because you're moving away from POS more and you're going towards tablets type of thing. So you could have an application being driven off of a tablet, off of one server, another server going ahead and doing your, your rich media within the store, these types of things. So things that you don't need to have a huge box running a, like a very powerful database, but you still need to have that high compute play, high, high core play, so you have, dense, so you have the density from a CPU perspective. But also at the same time, having the capability to have enough storage to make it useful locally, rather than having to go remote for your, for your, for your storage. So as far as like VDI workloads, GPU, cards? Good question. At FCS, we don't have we don't have a, we don't have GPU, but it's in plan okay. to put a GPU within this box. Okay. So right now, you would still use a different solution mm -hmm. for a VDI type VDI of VDI thing. I mean, depending on the density of the VDI. VDI. Right. I mean, if you had a and small the loads, yeah. right, exactly. If you had a smaller VDI density, then you could you, yes, you could use this. Okay. Okay, but if you want to really get the, the most bang for your buck, as you said, you know, yeah, you put a GPU on there, and that is something we have in plan. Or you're space constrained here. So for an on-node GPU, you very space constrained, so it's not going to be a high performing where you can have you know, 32 plus users on there. It's going to be for a smaller number of users on the VDI perspective. We're thinking about things, ways to do, VD, uh, do, do graphics differently, but nothing's committed yet. So this is not really meant for VDI. VSI, yes. VDI, not so much. Okay. But if you do look at, if you, on, on top of that, to add on, onto that, if you do look at AMD, they do have some, um, some, uh, some, what do they call the play cards? Or uh, uh, they, they have some things that, that show that, from the AMD perspective, since it does have a higher core count, then you can go ahead and, from a VDI perspective, um, or from a, a VM perspective as well, um, you, since you have a higher core count. Again, not for huge VDI implementations, but it, there, there are some advantages there. From a from a an AMD perspective, Mark, in relation to the uh, GPU plan, mm -hmm. um, how does that going to affect f a your v the VDI play? Well, right now, uh, what we've asked, uh, obviously, we have limited slots uh, and capabilities. So, um, right now, we're exploring with engineering supporting an NVIDIA P4 in the by 16 slot. Now, keep in mind, though, that if you have that card in that slot, you will not be able to have a VIC, right? You can have one or the other kind of thing. Uh, in terms of down the road, uh, future roadmap things, uh, we do envision doing a, a GPU-enabled tray for this, uh, which would have a compute complex and then GPU in the upper. So it would be a 2U high type node yeah. uh, type of solution. But, that would be uh, good. As I said, there's nothing committed yet. That's just one, that's one of the reasons why we actually have it numbered. We have a one, two on top of each other, and then three and four on top of each other, in relation to that type of that with, type of that type of solution. With the OCP card support, is there also OCP power support? The DC bus in rack bus for OCP. Mark, do you know that from the OCP perspective? I off the top of my head, I don't know. We have to look. I have to yeah. confirm okay. that with engineering. Just, I haven't looked into that yet. Okay. Uh, here's what I was talking about in relation to target workloads. In relation to here, so simulations, fraud detection, high frequency trading, more simulations, modeling, online gaming. And we have, if you were to go ahead and like mesh this with the S series, for instance. This is, a, this is on, online gaming, but it could go to other industries as well. You'd have your, you'd have your gaming in your, your user interfacing type of things going on to 4200 for the high compute, and then your data going ahead and getting onto your S series being collected there, and then analyzed there to monetize that data that you're collecting. 
So the thing is, how can I go ahead and sell more stuff to my customers based on the data that's being collected um, through the high compute, uh, the high core count stuff applications? What are the questions that we have on the platform? Unless I had everything in as 20 something slides that. <laughs> <laughs> It's not really a big thing then. I'll just throw it out if we're just doing Q&A for a few minutes. The, um, you know, it's, it's been, I, I've been seeing a lot more lately with the 10, 25, 50, and 100, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to the 40. Is that, uh, you know, a definite, I mean, that's just where you guys are going for all your compute platforms now, ditching the 40? No, not necessarily. Oh, not we're actually sort of what you've got here. We're actually going to be having, we will have, uh, the plan is to have, the, the plan is to have 40 on this, post FCS. Um, it's, we're waiting on, it'll be like a second gen, the second rev of the fourth gen VIC. Right. Okay. Uh, which we'll be looking at for this platform. Um, yeah, again, I see why this makes more sense. I mean, the 50, the 2050, 100 makes a lot more sense overall, but there's still a big install base. Of exactly, the 40. 40 gig and, you know whatever right. out there. So. And there are 40 gig um, OCP cards available today that you just that we haven't qualified them okay. on here. But if there was a use case, someone came to us and said, hey, we have this and we, need, we want to have, like want to purchase a thousand of these. You know, I guarantee you we're going to have engineering looking at, it, looking at adding another card to our ACP uh, stable of cards. Right. Um, but from a VIC perspective, we still have the 40 gig. It's not, it's not a dead platform. Okay. We're still going forward with 40 gig and it'll be in sometime in the future. And just to follow on to that, so there is a difference between what Cisco has tested and supported on our HCL and versus what will work. You know, right. it's a PCIe sure. slot, it's electrically PCIe on, on one thing, so will it fit? You know, same thing with the OCP too. It's an industry standard form factor, so just because we haven't tested doesn't mean it won't work. But then you deal with tax. Exactly, I was just gonna say, <laughs> it's, it, lots of things so, will work, but yeah. getting the tax support and the qualification. Yeah, that's no I get different it. than any other yeah. vendor. I mean, it's Yeah, a, sure, no, no, that's right. not anything to do with you. But we do have that in plan, it is in plan. Yeah. What do you guys think, what do you guys think, let me ask you a question if you don't mind. Um, you know, where do you see this platform fitting in? You know, where do you think that, where have we, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you feel that this might fit very nicely in? from a solutions perspective. Well, I was thinking the VDI stuff until you mentioned the graphics card bit. I'm a little stumped on, there's a lot of the applications that I would think it'd be really good for would require that particular processing. Uh -huh. So I feel like that is just kind of a limitation. Not having the GPU at FCS? Yeah. GPU at FCS. yeah. Okay. Say heavy containerized workloads. Heavy containerized. Yeah, would, would probably be a good fit. Okay. Um, from a solutions perspective, you know, do you see prioritizing those types of solutions? Where would you see us, if you had to say what, one to three, like the highest priority, what would you, what would you recommend from a, from a solutions perspective on this? Because we have a lot of solutions with, from our solutions team that we want to be able to do with only a limited amount of resources. So if you, if you think that there's something that's much higher priority from solutions, please let us know. What do you think? I think anytime you take a high Anytime you're coming out with an ultra high density core based platform, I mean the GPU, the VDI thing becomes sort of an obvious, I think, target. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously you guys have plenty of other solutions, but I mean, that's, you know, very large VDI deployments obviously suck, you know, cores, right. memory, everything. Right. So, uh, you know, the tray idea, you know, or whatever you come up with, I think. Yeah, I mean, if you could, if you could have a completely separate tray that's just you know connected, and if you could have it half and half, something like that. I mean, I think that would, um, you know, as long as you could get enough graphics power to match the number of cores and everything you've got in this thing, that's the other challenge, right? I'm but, thinking gaming too and uh, GIS applications. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Those sorts of things, but they would still again require GPU. GPU. So. Yeah. Uh -huh. So other than the GPU, based upon your knowledge <laughs> of competitive platforms. <laughs> And you know other things. What is missing from this box? Seems to have the, the full feature set of, of everything but cheap. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's flexible. It has a lot of de de different deployment scenarios, so different uh, connectivity options. That's really important. Um, seems to be a, a good fit for replacement of, say, we have bought 500 C-Series in the last year instead of you know, buying 500 of those just for pure compute. This mm -hmm. would be a good option to replace you know, several, several U of uh, rack space. Especially when you're paying for power, right, in a data center. So how much power can you deliver to a rack today, out of curiosity? Oh, I would have no idea. Okay. Yeah, I'd, you have to calculate that out, I don't know. Yeah, because that's, that's one of the big things with all of the density is how much power can you deliver to the rack. There's a, a, a thing about like a four-foot <coughs> rack. Is that's all I can put in there because how much power I can deliver. Mm -hmm. um, so that's anything with density. And then also cables. Um, if you're doing this, if you uh, have not run that slide that was a radar graph, if you have C220s uh, versus a C125, you can have 210 cables on this because the thing of two for each VIC yeah, that's true. Uh, for four nodes and then two for the power. So cable, you know, we're talking about blades rising on blades, cable, cable, cable reduction. Mm -hmm. And so this is also one of those things. It's, it's no worse than a C220 except it's twice as dense. So you get the power cable savings. <laughs> There. The compute per cable is the yeah, same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you can get away, you can wait, get away from that problem with the too many cables by running, you know, as far as your network, things like that, by running the, God, I can, there's a couple places that make them, and I can't, I can't think of who off the top of my head, but the ultra thin uh, Cat 6, Cat 6A, whatever cables that are, that are super tiny. Um, and we're seeing a lot of that get deployed. Okay. Uh, they're almost, I mean, they're all, they, they almost look like fiber. Yeah, you know, they're like so thin and flexible. To the top of the rack, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, Perfectly fine for that. Yeah, so I think that would work. I mean, you could you could clear out your cable mess that way. The act, the act Power's of, another. The, the active cables, AOC cables, is that, or something, or is it even thinner than that? No, no. These these are, uh, you know, I'm trying to think who makes it. It's one of it's one of the manufacturers that makes a lot of patch panels and stuff. Like okay. That, where they've got Panduit or Panduit, yeah. one of them. Yeah. Okay, I'll take a look at those because we might need to look at. That. So Brianna is giving us the hook. So yeah. <laughs> Let me just close by thanking everyone. Really appreciate your attention here today. Uh, you can go look up his breakout session that was this morning. Uh, it's even more chocked full. Like I said, he, he worked with me like, no, no, look, you've got all these slides on the storage configurations. Just do that one and talk to it. So he goes into detail, depth there. We are in the AMD booth and in the Cisco World of Solutions uh, where you have the big crane uh, thing out there in the World of Solutions. We're just behind that. Uh, so come see the hardware. Uh, come ask us more questions. We'd love to, you know, shoot the breeze with you for a while. And you're welcome to send me an email whenever C A S H A P A. It's my first name and last first initial last name at Cisco. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate Thank you. your time.